Lock and Dam number 26 was built in 1938, but was deemed obsolete because of the amount of barge traffic passing through the Alton area. In 1969, a replacement lock and dam was authorized, although construction did not begin until 1980. After completing several engineering and environmental studies during that decade, just days before the bids were to be opened for a contract to begin construction, a lawsuit halted the effort. To correct the problem, an in-depth environmental impact statement was prepared and proper authorization from Congress was requested, which came in 1978 with the passage of the Inland Waterway Revenue Act. Once the legal issues were resolved, the groundbreaking ceremony was held on April 25, 1980, and the project was originally scheduled to be completed around 1988. But unlike the construction of the original Locks and Dam 26, which occurred during a relatively dry decade, the construction of the Mel Price project took place during a very wet decade. Floods in 1982, 1986, and the record flood of 1993 all caused delays. Finally, on February 1, 1990, the water was transferred from the old pool to the new pool and barges began locking through the new main lock. The summer of 1994 marked the completion of this monumental structure. The Honorable Charles Melvin Price was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from the 21st Congressional District of Illinois from November 7, 1944 until his death on April 22, 1988. Born in East St. Louis, Illinois on January 1, 1905 and a graduate of St. Louis University, he held several positions before entering the political arena. During his long congressional career, he was a member of several defense-related committees, but it's best known for his work as chairman of the House Committee on Armed Services from 1975 to 1985. It was through those assignments that he was able to dedicate his political career to a strong American defense. The Melvin Price Lock and Dam Project is a vital link in the Mississippi River waterway system which serves the central United States and ties together the agricultural Middle West, the Industrial East, the Great Lakes, and the Gulf of Mexico. The first stage contract was awarded on October 20, 1981 to Groves, Atkinson, and Ball. The contract consisted of constructing six and a half gate bays of the dam. On February 24, 1985, the Tanner gates were raised to permit flow through the completed portion of the dam. Removal of the first stage coffer dam was completed on March 2, 1985, and the entire contract was completed in September 1985. The cost of this contract was approximately $162 million. The contract for the second stage was awarded on September 28, 1984 to J.S. Groves and Sons, Guy F. Atkinson's company, and Dillingham Construction for $227 million. The work included the coffer dam, the main lock, and two piers of the dam. Construction under this contract commenced on February 14, 1985 and was completed in January 1990. The lock was placed in full operation in February of 1990. The third stage cofferdam contract was awarded in May 1989 to Albarisi Construction Company for $14 million, with construction completed in April 1990. The auxiliary lock and remainder of the dam contract was awarded to Albarisi EB on October 11, 1989 for $206 million. The work started on December 3, 1989 and was completed early of 1994. The cofferdam is a temporary means to an end. They only existed while the three stages of the lock and dam construction was underway. Their purpose was to hold back the Mississippi River so work could be done in a dry area on the riverbed. In total, there were 19,000 strips of sheet piling, each measuring 95 to 107 feet long. If laid end to end, they would stretch 364 miles in length or cover 62.5 football fields. 3 million square feet of steel weighing 30,000 tons was used to make this many strips of sheet piling. The coffer dams were filled with 1.3 million cubic yards of sand, 
All of this was formed into the 127 cells making the entire cofferdam by the carpenters union and looked like giant silos that measured 60 to 90 feet tall. Of course, not all 127 cells were built at once, but in three stages during the construction. Melvin Price is a heavily reinforced lock built with monoliths, each measuring about 80 feet along the axis. The Corps Waterway Experiment Station at Vicksburg, Mississippi conducted research on concrete creep and shrinkage over the lifetime of a structure, finding that they will often impose greater forces than other loads. 350,000 cubic yards of concrete was fed to the lock from a batch plant on the Missouri bank. Conveyor flights carry the mix 815 feet across a bridge cantilevered from the upstream face of the dam down the length of the coffer dam and laterally across the lock. The longest run to a pour was close to 3,000 feet. The batch plant produced up to 300 cubic yards per hour. A conveyor carried the mix across the spillway and dumped it through a hopper into a perpendicular belt in the coffer dam. That in turn fed a tower supported rolling conveyor spanning the lock. Morgan Manufacturing Company from Yankton, South Dakota designed and built the 650 foot per minute conveyor system. The concrete's temperature cannot exceed 50 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes after mixing. Crews of varying sizes usually work two 10 hour shifts a day totaling 570 employees on the job site. The dam and its lock will stretch about 1,750 feet across the river and have a 2,000 foot spillway dike extend into the Missouri shore. The spillway is designed to be overtopped once the river reaches its flood level. Nine tainter gates weighing a million pounds each control flow of the water to maintain pool levels for navigation. If the river is above flood level, the tainter gates are raised out of the water resulting in an open river stage. The control room at the Melvin Price Lock and Dam was one of the first to be operated by computers and program logic controllers. It takes many people to keep the locks and dam operating efficiently 24-7, 365 days a year. The shift chief runs the equipment that controls the lock chambers, logs the boats, sets the tainter gates, flushes ice, and communicates with the pilot. The lockman escorts the tows and boats locking through, verifying safe lockage of both personnel and the motor vessel, checking to see if bumpers are in place to protect the walls and barges, and ensuring safe practices are followed. The vertical lift gate consists of three sections that slide past each other like an elevator door turned sideways. When up, the lift gate holds back the upstream water so the water in the lock can be lowered to the downstream level. When down, the three sections of the gate rest underwater. The three leaf lift gate lodges in the seal when retracted and rises 38.5 feet. This type of gate is more expensive but can operate under ice conditions. The miter gate consists of two doors that open inward and rise flush against the lock walls. Because debris can become lodged behind a miter gate when it is closing, air is pumped behind it to push debris out. When closed, the miter gate come together at a slight angle. This design makes the closed gates stronger as water presses against them. Viewed from the side, the tainter gate and its armature look like a pie-shaped wedge. The cylindrical section of the gate forms the damming surface. The tainter gates pivot on pins attached to the supporting piers. The shape of the gate is such that the water pressure behind the gate has little effect and the hoist machinery merely has to overcome the dead weight of the gate. After many years of planning, replacement of Lock 26 at Alton was decided upon. Many dedicated employees from the St. Louis District worked tirelessly to get the project approved and to oversee the final design. Jimmy Bissell served as the resident engineer on the building of the Melvin Price Lock and Dam, which turned out to be the largest public works project ever undertaken in the St. Louis region. Jim provided the contract administration for all the construction contracts, performed inspections, reviewed shop drawings, and oversaw labor payments. Bob Huey served as the chief of design. He oversaw the architectural and engineering aspects during the design phase and was the key contact through the duration of the project. Bob was instrumental in working on the original hand-drawn blueprints done on CAD workstations that were kept in 60 degree rooms in the district office where a group of dedicated engineers worked in two shifts. 
one starting at 2 a.m. and the other at 10 a.m. This showed the state of technology at the time. Bill Sutton served as the project manager. Bill worked tirelessly to make presentations through Mark 2000 to gain interest, explained ideas, and garnered public support for the project. Bill worked for 14 years of his career to see the dam finished. Tom Miller recalled the days working at the old Lock 26 where they would spend 24 hours locking one boat. Boats from as far away as New Orleans would call to reserve a place in the queue and jackhammers were the tool of choice for chipping ice that would freeze behind the gates. He knew the transition from the old lock to the new one would be a challenge and noted that it was like going from a 1940s era car to a modern hybrid. Tom and a crew of 17 started at the new lock touted as being the most technologically advanced in the world. Tom liked the problem solving aspects of the job. Joe Schwink, project engineer and district geotechnical engineer, managed both the design and construction. He reviewed and approved contractor structural drawings and enjoyed the challenges of having to deal with contractor changes and claims. Erdick designed mock dam structures with test toes and had actual pilots test barges entering the lock and the effects of revetment on the Illinois bank. Walter Wally Feld served as the operations assistant chief of navigation. His role as a structural engineer was instrumental in determining how the design parameters and constant changes affected the building of the Melvin Price Lock and Dam. Wally worked on the original study that designed the arms of the Tainer Gates and assisted with several preliminary design studies. Red Buckholt worked to resolve the conflicts with the contractors. He saw the new locks and dam as tribute to American economics on a worldwide scale. He also knew how important this project was to the balance of trade. Don Schrader served as the lock master at Old Lock 26 and worked at Lock and Dam 25. He dealt with several maintenance issues and daily problems. The old lock had three roller gates in the middle of the dam for passing ice. Don noted that when they passed ice it would cause them to lose pool. He thought the operation and maintenance of Old Lock 26 was more of a science. Andy Schimpf, design engineer, had an extensive electrical engineering background that allowed him to maintain the computer programs and ensured their working order in the early days of the Melvin Price Lock and Dam. The Melvin Price Lock and Dam is an incredible achievement of will, precision, sensitivity, brute strength, and sheer human ingenuity. It offers a blueprint for the future in our response to environmental concerns, navigation needs, and the growing diversity of users placing demands on the river. And it offers hope. Hope to farmers that their historic partnerships with the river will continue to be there as they pursue global trade opportunities. Hope to all living things that the natural wonders of the river life will continue to dazzle those that take the time to discover. Hope to communities that the rivers will serve as a tool for economic development, tourism opportunities, and to stimulate and maintain jobs, personnel and business revenues, and a tax base. The Melvin Price Lock and Dam is a vital link in a critical intermodal transportation network and provides ample evidence that both commerce and natural habitats can thrive through inspired stewardship.